Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Bobby Robbins, president of the University of Arizona, and thank you for joining us for another video with one of our true superstars at the University of Arizona. We have a plan to get us back to the university in the fall. Our three T's, test, trace, and treat. But then it's up to all of us to make sure we stay healthy when we come back together. Here today to talk about this new way of living and working and what it looks like is Dr. Kelly Reynolds. She is a professor and chair of the Department of Community, Environment and Policy at the Mail and Enid Zuckerman College of Public Health and director of the university's Environment, Exposure, Science and a Risk Assessment Center. Wow, Kelly, that's a lot of titles and a lot of work. Thank you for joining me today to, uh, to have a discussion about First of all, whether it's even safe for us to bring people back to campus, and if we think it is, uh, it'll never be, of course, totally safe, um, but can we provide the maximum protection and the policy guidelines uh, to help us all come back together uh, in a productive and as safe as possible manner? How, how are you doing today, Kelly? Well, I'm doing great. I think uh, most of us are adjusting to the whirlwind of activities that COVID-19 has brought about, but I also have another special interest in that I have two children that are students at the University of Arizona. So uh, uh, this great. is very important to me that it's safe for everyone to come back and also for my family to come back. So we are very vested in making sure that that happens and our research is right in line to really evaluate how it's safe to do that. And we have lots of guidelines and recommendations and research to support the decisions. So, so many of the uh, professors who are doing incredible research in this area are taking uh, advantage of the great QTR benefit and have their uh, children as students at the, at the U of A. So I, I appreciate that. You, you spent your career doing research on infection prevention uh, and aspects around public health. So you're uniquely prepared when a pandemic like this uh, hits the U of A. What, what are some of the things you and your team have been doing to help fir first responders in our broader community remain safe as they come back to work? Well, my lab has been conducting research on the transmission of viruses in the environment for decades. And one of the things that we've learned is that very simple interventions can be extremely effective at breaking the cycle of germ transmission. And in terms of SARS-CoV-2, we know that the virus is spread most effectively through close contact with large droplet aerosols from an infected person. But our research also shows that these uh, viruses stay in the airspace for a very limited period of time and they settle onto surfaces. So that's where obviously social distancing has been promoted as a primary method of protection and that's absolutely appropriate. And also the use of physical barriers like face masks is, is really recommended. But the other thing that we're focusing research on is how do we keep our environment clean? Environmental hygiene is really important for breaking that cycle of disease transmission. So as cough and sneeze aerosols settle on surfaces in, the, in a matter of seconds to minutes, we know they can survive there for a matter of hours to maybe even days. So one of the things that we're really working on and working with um, local businesses and also first responders is how to keep their environments clean, keep their surfaces clean, and also implementing frequent hand hygiene so that you're not constantly uh, recontaminating your hands from surfaces that might be contaminated. So we know that this cycle of transmission and the cycle of cross-contamination are important intervention steps that we can take. So we've developed plans for local businesses and with first responders about how they can go back to work and do so safely. Oh, that's fantastic. I, I, I think you hit the, the fundamentals. Wash your hands frequently, cover your face, keep, keep distance from as many people as you possibly can. Uh, and, and so I, I really appreciate all the incredible work you've been doing. Are there a couple of success stories uh, that you can share based on these type of checklists and uh, better practices uh, in action that you could share with our audience? Yes, one of our greatest success stories involves a collaboration with Tucson Fire Department 
they were experiencing an increase in MRSA infections. And MRSA is an antibiotic resistant staph bacterium. It uh, causes very serious skin infections and can even be fatal if it's spread to other parts of the body. It's also very difficult to treat. And in working with Tucson Fire Department at the time, they had um, over three years time frame. they had 17 cases of MRSA compared to what historically would have been one or two random cases over that time frame. So after riding along with them and looking at some of their practices, looking at their infection control protocols they had in place, we identified hotspots that were being missed for germ transmission. So through checklists and training and making sure they had the right products handy, we helped them improve on their infection control protocol. And what happened as a result is they had zero MRSA cases for the next three years that we surveyed their environment. So most, more recently, we again collaborated with Tucson Fire Department, and we took some of those lessons we learned from the MRSA outbreak and applied them to what's happening right now with COVID-19. We developed a 10-minute micro-training video, and to date, that's actually had over 19,000 views. So we really feel like we're having an impact in developing effective uh, communication tools for making sure first responders are properly trained in, in terms of how to maximize their health and safety. So we've done similar approaches in restaurants and hotels and in office buildings, even in an office building at the University of Arizona. And we found that really simple interventions like increasing the use of hand sanitizers and increasing the use of surface disinfectants can have an impact of reducing your risk of illness by anywhere between 80 and 99%. And that's a really effective reduction in disease that we're, we're really proud about being able to help our local community uh, understand that these interventions are really doable. And if we work together and apply them, we can have a very safe, hygienic environment. Yeah, well, that's fantastic. And it, and it highlights and validates uh, the reason why a land grant AAU research university is so vital to the community for all of the things that you're doing, not only internally to help us uh, with our 60,000 small community family, but also uh, the surrounding communities as well. So thank you for all of that. Uh, certainly in my previous life, um, MRSA could cert shut down a, uh, a cardiac surgery program uh, because if you get a sternal wound infection from MRSA, uh, it's usually fatal or, or at least very debilitating. And just basic fundamentals, uh, when we looked at hand washing, the hand washing uh, routines in one of the top hospitals that I've worked in in the world uh, was under 20%. So once we got that to over 95%, miraculously our uh, infection risk uh, went down. For, for everyone at home, are there frequently asked questions that you get over and over that you could share with us uh, and, and answer? For instance, what? What does the CDC mean when they say, wash your hands frequently? <laughs> yeah, and I think frequently means something different to different people. I think you have to really evaluate what your practices are and how likely you are to become, uh, con your hands to become contaminated in the first place. So, but the general guidelines from the CDC is that we should be washing our hands before, during, and after preparing food, before eating food, Certainly, if you're caring for someone that's sick, that's the time to really step up your hygiene protocol after using the toilet or changing diapers. Uh, if you also have a cough or sneeze or blow your nose, you should be washing your hands. We know that contact with pets or their waste or their food even can transmit disease. So make sure that after you've had contact with your pets, you wash your hands or touching any garbage or anything that you think might be contaminated. And specific to the COVID-19 pandemic, we should also be washing our hands after being in public. Um, if you're touching surfaces that other people frequently touch, like the ATM buttons or gas pumps or door handles, shopping carts, this is a time to also practice hand hygiene. And especially before touching our eyes, nose, or mouth, because that's really the cycle of disease transmission from a surface to your hand. And then if you touch your eyes, nose, or mouth, especially your nose with COVID-19, we know that's a mechanism for entry of the virus into the body. So being aware of those behaviors is really important and understanding when you're likely to become uh, in contact with the germ or with, with somebody who might be carrying the virus, that's the time to really wash your hands. Well, that's fantastic. And 
I, I, um, I've heard so many people contact me and say, uh, there, was, there was actually a legitimate case of uh, uh, someone that I know who had an immunocompromised, actually by design, actively immunocompromised child who had had an organ transplant and they were scrubbing down their house constantly with bleach and uh, other things. And the, the individual went to get fingerprinted and the, uh -huh. her fingerprints had been uh, uh, basically obliterated because of all of the bleach she had been using on her countertops and all through her house. The one thing that I know personally is my uh, hands are shriveled up I think it's because of all of the, uh, not just uh, hand-washing soap, but I use a lot of, uh, as, as you know, in the hospital, we always, before we go into a room, we gel in and gel out. So I use a, a lot of alcohol-based uh, uh, disinfectants on my hand. Do you have any um, recommendation for a good hand moisturizer that all of us can use out there? Right, I think it is possible to overdo it. We don't want people using disinfectants and, and hand sanitizers to the point where they're creating another problem with skin irritation. So it is important to use a moisturizer and there, you know, there are a lot of great brands on, on the market, I think, uh, that can really help with those issues. But wearing gloves too when you're cleaning and using disinfectants can help protect your skin from those irritations. But we're all washing our hands more now and using hand sanitizer. So I do think it's important, as you mentioned, make sure you're also taking those extra precautions to re-moisturize. A lot of the hand sanitizers have built-in moisturizers. So look for those products as well if you're having that problem. Yeah, so hopefully there's an antibacterial, antifungal, antiviral uh, moisturizer. There's an opportunity out there for all you entrepreneurs. <laughs> uh, the, the final thing is, um, I've seen these videos of um, uh, these simulations of these mannequins uh, and the lights go down and you get, looks like almost green fluorescent protein labeled particles uh, for, for a sneeze or a mild cough or a really vigorous cough. And as you said in uh, some of your earlier comments, you know, six feet is sort of the guideline from the CDC, but uh, these particles with a really hard cough uh, can go 12 to 20 feet. So I think face covering is going to be something that as we, uh, you and other of the hundreds of domain experts across the university are, are working with uh, Provost Folks and Dr. Carmona and, and his instant command uh, team to pull together all of the available information uh, and a meta-analysis of the data to help guide us toward policies and procedures that will provide the maximum protection for those of us who, who choose. And I, I want it to be a choice. Uh, students will obviously make the choice, but for our staff and our faculty, if their job allows them to choose, I'm, I'm always uh, uh, wondering how you actually do heart surgery uh, from a Zoom room, which you can, of course. <laughs> but many of our jobs, you can. So if you choose to come back, uh, we'll have policies, procedures, and guidelines that'll help maximize protection. So uh, Dr. Kelly Reynolds, a true global public health expert and a superstar at the University of Arizona, thank you for, in, for joining us today. I know everyone will be uh, better educated and better equipped to, uh, to tackle this uh, pandemic uh, as long as it lasts. And I think it's going to last for a long time until we get a, an effective vaccine, which uh, is at a minimum probably of a year, but maybe even longer. So Kelly, thank you so much for all the incredible work you're doing, uh, not only inside the U of A, but for the community and, and for your leadership. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Okay, well, everyone stay safe, stay away from people as much as you can when you go out. As Kelly's told us, practice that good public health hygiene, wash your hands, cover your face, and try to stay away from as many people as possible. Until next time, everyone really be safe out there. And as always, bear down.